Welcome to Episode 9 of the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by United Poultry Concerns. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can find all our shows at hopefortheanimalspodcast.org. And I welcome your feedback. My email is hope at upc-online.org. On the podcast today, we have an interesting interview with Kelsey Epperly. Kelsey is a staff attorney with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and she will share her experiences exposing humane washing in animal agriculture. She helps ALDF file false advertising and illegal and unfair business practice lawsuits, and these uncover the cruel farming practices, especially in products that are labeled humane. But first, I want to answer the question, is there an ethical egg? A lot of people are learning that farming hints for their eggs is incredibly cruel, and they're even questioning humane labels like cage-free and free-range. They know that they are not telling the whole truth about the treatment of the animals, but they still believe that they're are these other ways to find ethical eggs, like from a farmer's market or from a backyard or small farm or from a neighbor or a friend? Are these eggs ethical to eat? So I want to explore that question. So up until this pandemic year, I spent a lot of my activist time tabling. And one of the most common questions that I've gotten over my decades of tabling is people asking, what are the most ethical eggs to eat? Where is there an ethical egg? People are always cooking up these potential scenarios like, well, what if it's from my local natural food store? They research all the eggs and only buy the best of the best. Or if there's eggs from the farmer's market, then that's okay, right? Or if it's a neighbor's chicken, or if I know that chicken and I know she had a good life and won't be killed, can I eat those eggs? So the answer to all these possible scenarios is no, you really shouldn't eat those eggs. And here's why. As long as eggs are considered food, hens will be considered a food production unit, a commodity. Even if there is this implausible, rare, ideal circumstance where the hen is actually in totally humane conditions... And if you're buying the eggs, it's almost assuredly that that is not the case. There's no way that we could feed over 7 billion people this way. It simply can't be done profitably. We have to stop looking at chicken's eggs and her flesh, for that matter, as food. We cannot consider animals as commodities anymore. No matter how ethical one operation even wants to be, There will be mistreatment in another. There will be abuse, confinement in another. There will be misery and corruption in another. If we truly want all farmed animals free of suffering, we must end the use of farmed animals as food across the board. So let's look at some specific examples. So first we'll start with buying eggs from the natural food store or from a farmer's market. And then I'll also talk about backyard farms or getting eggs from a neighbor in a minute. But starting with buying eggs from your local co-op or even from a farmer's market, no matter the size of the farm or the label on the carton, There are hidden cruelties that are economically necessary to making income on eggs. Egg farms, they just, they can't profitably hatch their own chicks. They purchase chicks from huge, heartless hatcheries. And I go into great detail about the hatchery industry in the Reason for Vegan Series 1, The Egg Industry Exposed. So I encourage you to go and listen to that podcast if you haven't already and learn more. But just to summarize, in these hatcheries, the baby birds are not hatched in a warm nest with a mother hen's love and affection the way it should be naturally, what every baby chick desires and deserves. 
but rather they're separated from their mothers. They're born in these metal drawers and thrust into a frightening world of conveyor belts and metal machinery and workers tossing them about roughly like inanimate objects. The male chicks in the egg industry don't grow fast enough to be profitable for meat, so they are killed just hours after hatching by the millions thrown away alive in dumpsters outside the hatcheries. They, they slowly die of dehydration and exposure, uh, or they're ground up alive in maceration machines. These horrors don't go away with a humane label at the co-op or a farmer's market. A small cage-free or free-range farm will not be able to feed the chickens whose egg production has waned. Just like a large farm, they can't retire hundreds of hens. So birds that are only a couple of years old will be killed by brutal methods like slow and painful gassing, throat slashing. Sometimes the chickens are buried alive. So just because there is a label on the eggs at the farmer's market that says humane or free range or pasture raised or even no label so they look kind of homesteady, almost certainly those hens were hatched in heartless hatcheries and will go to a brutal death at a very young age. So don't be fooled by the pastoral images and benevolent words on the labels. The truth is hidden, and even the supposed best of the best farms are still a nightmare for chickens. I go into more detail and some personal stories of things that I've seen and experienced in the Reason for Vegan Series 3, Cage Free and Free Range Explained, so I encourage you to go and listen to that podcast for more information. So now I want to talk about getting eggs from a neighbor or from a small farm down the street. There may be scenarios where someone is able to get eggs from a neighbor or from a small farm in their area, and perhaps they can even see the hens and they appear to be living the good life on this farm or in this person's backyard. So why shouldn't we eat those eggs? First of all, you don't know the whole story. Even a neighbor most likely purchased the chicks from a feed store or from mail order, so they gave money to the cruel hatchery industry and supported it and may continue to in the future. Subjecting newborn chicks to the horrors of being shipped through the mail, it's awful, and it's deadly. Many don't survive. The only ethical way to obtain a chicken is to rescue her from a sanctuary or a humane society or the local shelter or from a bad situation. But even if the hens were rescued and they have a clean and protected enclosure where they're safe at night and will be able to live out their lives in peace, which is rarely the case, we still shouldn't eat their eggs. Such an improbable situation could only feed a very few people in a rural area that are lucky enough to have access to this neighbor or small farm. This operation would not be able to consistently supply the local restaurants or groceries to be profitable enough to have the quantity to provide eggs, even to just a small town's grocery store. They would have to start purchasing chicks from hatcheries. They couldn't use rescued birds. They'd have to get rid of chickens that are not producing efficiently, basically killing them when they're only a couple of years old. They would need to start keeping more hens in a smaller space. And so it goes down the same road that led us to industrial large-scale farming. It's, it's elitist. Why should a few people who can afford to live in a lovely rural area with farm fresh eggs down the street be able to have eggs, but not the entire city of San Francisco or Oakland? There's no way we could feed a large city with eggs from hens who were rescued and able to live their lives out. It can't be done profitably. So it's really, it's unfair for an elite few to be able to have this niche market of eggs and not everyone. 
this romanticized notion that we can go back to the pastoral days of small ethical farming, it's a delusion. Farming animals was never humane, never ethical, never romantic. Confining, breeding, and farming animals for their flesh and their bodily secretions, it was never humane. As long as we consider eggs food, the probability for exploitation is 100%. We have close to 8 billion people now to feed on this planet. Humane farming of chickens to feed the billions of people on this planet, it's impossible. Another factor in this is that it's important that we identify as vegans and that we abstain from all meat, dairy, and eggs. You know, a person may only eat eggs that they think are ethical, but then they identify as an egg eater. So let's say that you're at a friend's house and she baked some muffins and she says, oh, well, there's eggs in them, but they're from a good source. Well, because you're an egg eater, you believe her and don't think much about it and you eat the muffin. But that good source could have been from Whole Foods, from a cage-free farm where the hens were de-beaked, they never felt the sun on their feathers or the earth beneath them, and they lived a short, miserable life. The better scenario is to say, thanks, but I'm vegan and not eat the muffin. You know, this, this demonstrates that first, it's highly suspect that that egg was actually from a happy chicken. And second, that we're choosing not to exploit animals for their bodies anymore. Some people may feel like, oh, it's not going to make any difference if I eat my friend's muffin. They're already baked. This one incident isn't going to save chickens. But there is psychological evidence that it's easier to adopt a change long term if you're all in. If you are mostly plant-based and will eat the occasional muffin with an egg in it, then you're more likely to waver and buy something with eggs in it at the grocery store or at a restaurant where it really does count. Veganism is a boycott of a cruel industry and the products of misery. And what you buy and don't buy tells the market what they should provide. Identifying as a vegan means that you are all in, you're not dabbling, and you're more likely to shop your ethics. So you tell your friend that you're vegan and you don't eat the muffin, and you can then bake some delicious vegan muffins to bring to your friend next time so she can try them. Bottom line is, as long as hen's eggs are considered food, the potential for abuse is 100%. Assuming that we can feed the billions of people on this planet with backyard ethical eggs, it's a fantasy. The quantity and volume needed are just too big. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to read my book, The Ultimate Betrayal. I go into much more detail about supposedly humane methods of farming and labeling and for further reading on the chicken industry as a whole, I encourage you to read Prisoned Chickens, Poisoned Eggs by UPC's Karen Davis. Eggs are easily substituted in baking. There is a lot of information online about how to substitute eggs in baking. And even though there's probably millions of vegan recipes without eggs, you can still use your old recipes and just substitute things like flax seeds and banana and there's egg substitute products. I have veganized all my grandmama's dessert recipes and I bake her Christmas cookies totally vegan every year and it calls for about six eggs or something and I substitute and they're delicious. They're just as good as my grandmama's. So straight up egg dishes like omelets and scrambled eggs, a bit harder to replace, but there are new interesting products like the Veg, it's V-E-G-G, -G, which can be used to make omelets and all those things, scrambled eggs. Also, Just Egg has a frozen egg that you can use for this purpose. I, I haven't tried it yet, but I just bought some frozen vegan egg and cheese breakfast burritos from the company Daya. So there's lots of new products to explore. And I tell you, tofu scramble is so good. You can use nutritional yeast to make it a little, a little eggy. And there's some great, great substitutes that are so delicious.
so give them a try. We must stop this cycle of use and abuse of animals and live a truly cruelty-free vegan lifestyle and stop eating all eggs. I'll wrap up this section with a quote from my book. It's not our methods of animal agriculture that need to change. It is our unwillingness to give up animal products and animal farming. Okay, so I would like to bring in our guest now. Today we have Kelsey Eberly. She is a staff attorney with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, ALDF. And as a member of the organization's litigation program, Kelsey works to protect the lives of animals using civil litigation and regulatory advocacy. Kelsey joined the ALDF in 2014 after graduating from UCLA's School of Law. And there at UCLA, she was the chair of the Animal Law Society. Her practice at ALDF, uh, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, centers around combating false advertising and illegal and unfair business practices by the animal industry. And she works in both the meat industry and pet industry, like pet stores. And Kelsey has litigated numerous cases against animal products and puppy sellers, resulting in resolutions that have helped protect animals and stop humane washing. And we're going to talk more about what that is. Kelsey's commentary has appeared in national news outlets, including ABC News, Bloomberg, The New Republic, and more. We are really, really happy to have her here to help us understand more about animals and the law. So welcome, Kelsey. Thanks so much for having me. So I want to start, let's start at the beginning. So when and why did you go vegan? How did it lead you into practicing law for animals? What is your story? Yeah, I went vegetarian at a pretty young age. Um, you know, I was in high school and sort of did it without thinking too much about it. And I was vegetarian for many years, you know, through uh, college. And it wasn't really until after college that I began to sort of think about why I was vegetarian and, and sort of think about, you know, what animals uh, meant to me and what- And that, you know, that was your, your undergrad work, right? Before yeah, you got yeah. into UCLA. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I sort of, you know, started to think, um, I found myself just becoming more and more interested in animal related issues and then the, you know, many ways that animals suffer. And I started a program through the Humane Society. They used to have a, a university program, and I did a, a graduate certificate in, in um, animal policy and advocacy. And that was when I really sort of, you know, had my eyes open both to, you know, the, the ways that animals suffer, the, the myriad ways that they do, but also, you know, in particular, the ways that farmed animals suffer. And so at the same time that, you know, I was changing my diet and becoming vegan, I was also becoming aware of the ways that, you know, the law intersects with animals and sort of, you know, wondering what can I do with this? Can I make a career out of this? And that was when I applied to law school and then went to law school hoping to, you know, practice animal law and to use the law to help animals um, in a way that I, you know, really couldn't foresee when I entered law school, but, you know, which has sort of come to fruition in my career in ways, you know, that that have just been really rewarding. Um, so that's my story in a nutshell, I guess. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I, I love that when I was, you know, considering college and what to study back in like the late 80s, there was no options for any kind of animal programs or animal advocacy or anything. But now people have so many more options to actually do animal advocacy uh, in school and actually in graduate programs. So that's just awesome. I love that you were able to do that. And I also want to talk about humane washing. And of course, humane washing, like the term greenwashing, which more people probably have heard of, greenwashing is when a company markets a product to be more green or ecological when it's either either only slightly better or not better at all. So 
same with humane washing um, in the sense that it's animal industry marketing products as humane, implying that animals were humanely treated. But as I've written extensively in, in my book, The Ultimate Betrayal, that is simply not the case with these labels. And I know that you've also uh, seen this firsthand with the lawsuits that you work on. So where, where have you seen humane washing in your work? And how, uh, how is it that you've uh, exposed humane washing? Yeah, I mean, humane washing is really everywhere, like you say. I mean, I, I sort of think of it, you know, I think there's humane washing in terms of what are the claims, what are the, you know, ways that the that animal product industries in particular, you know, try to tell consumers and others that their products did not come from animals who suffered horribly. So that's sort of, you know, maybe the narrow definition of humane washing is, is, is the types of claims that these, you know, sellers make on their products, whether on labels or in marketing. But I sort of think of it in a broader sense of a deceptive way of describing what is happening, you know, describing every part of how animals are raised and killed and turned into meat. And so, you know, in, in general, I think many, many, many companies engage in it, but then there's certain companies that where, you know, the gulf between what the company is saying about how the animals are raised and treated and what is actually happening, you know, is even broader than other companies. And so in those cases of really great egregious human washing, egregious falsity, we have an opportunity to to use lawsuits and to use regulatory advocacy and pressing federal agencies to try to stop that because there are some laws that protect consumers from false and deceptive um, marketing and advertising. And those are the tools that we use to combat humane washing. Okay. And what are some of the claims that you see most often misused by animal product marketing? Yeah, it's, it's funny. This is, it's always changing because consumer sort of preference for certain claims changes over time. And also claims that companies use, you know, sort of become impossible for them to use because of lawsuits, because, you know, of exposure. So whereas we, we used to see claim humane, I think a little bit more on products and in marketing, you see that a little bit less. And now we see claims like natural which is sort of like the, the Uber claim uh, for humane washing that sort of connotes not only, you know, a more natural way of raising animals, but also a bunch of things about the product, you know, the way the, way the product is made um, or what it contains. So natural is a huge claim that we consider, you know, one, a, a humane washing claim as applied to the vast, vast majority of meat products. And then also things like rain grown or farm raised or responsibly raised or free range or cage free there's um there's really so many but i would say the most common ones are natural and you know things that sort of imply responsibility or stewardship and what's what's an example specifically in in one of your cases maybe in like the fair life case i know that that was a big exposure of the dairy products uh, from Fair Life, um, mm -hmm. or or another one. I mean, I'm just wondering some specifics about yeah. uh, you know what what they're claiming and what's really happening on the farm. Yeah. So in the Fair Life case, I remember picking up a bottle of Fair Life milk, not not to drink, but to look at the claims because that's what I'm always doing in supermarkets. And I looked at it and it said extraordinary care for our cows. And I thought, what does that mean? <laughs> that that means objectively that means something above the the usual and not only something above but you know something superlative the best care extraordinary care and so you know that means treating cows in in a better way than you know other dairy companies do and so you know the you don't have to watch more than 2 seconds of the video the undercover video from the the Fairlife farm to see that those cows were not being given extraordinary care. Another example from our case is, it, it really uh, is a different type of representation, but an illustration. So many companies, you know, have realized that they can't use claims uh, in, in terms of, uh, they can't use words 
that really are very specific about way, the way animals are raised because they can't substantiate them. So some companies use imagery. So another example was Trader Joe's had imagery of hens pecking out on a green, you know, green pasture with the barn doors flung wide open. That was the imagery that was emblazoned on its cartons of cage free eggs. When in reality, the hens were confined indoors and they never saw the light of day, never touched a blade of grass in their lives. Yeah, the the footage from the Fairlife uh, operation, the undercover video from that dairy, was some of the most brutal I've seen in a long time. I mean, I've, you know, it's always brutal and always awful. Undercover investigators never come out uh, saying, "Oh yeah, this farm was great. I had nothing to." <laughs> to film. Um, they always come out with horrible footage. But that Fairlife one, I, I remember the calves that were separated from the moms and the workers that were feeding the calves, where they were bottle feeding the calves, they were bottle feeding them and punching them at the same time, like hitting and slapping the calves in the face while they were feeding them. It was so awful to see. And then they dragged the calves uh, behind tractors, I believe. It was some of the most brutal footage I've seen. And for them to say that that they have extraordinary care of the cows on their packaging, I mean, it just shows you how much they lie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. It's really amazing. I mean, that and that's a situation where you know, on top of the the cruelty and the brutality of of just typical dairy, you also had this egregious abuse. I mean, you know, separate from that. So yeah, in no way were they giving extraordinary care. To the calves. So what are some of the specific legal tools that you use to go after the humane washing? How does it work? Sure. So basically every state has a version of, uh, or sometimes more than one version of an unfair and deceptive trade practices statute. And these statutes in general prohibit sellers from falsely marketing their products and making, you know, false representations in the marketing and sale of their products. And so depending on, you know, what state the consumer is in or, um, you know, what, what, uh, which one of those statutes we're using, we represent consumers who have purchased a product believing the representations that they were, you know, shown by the company, whether those were on the label or, you know, in, in an advertisement, you know, like a magazine advertisement or a YouTube advertisement. So we, we basically say, you know, this is, this is what the company is saying. And then we say, this is the reality. And that's where we show, you know, for example, like the fair life footage, we would say, this is how cows are actually treated. And when a company makes those false representations, um, you know, that can run afoul of these state uh, false advertising laws. So we, you know, prepare a complaint and file it, and um, usually in state court in whatever state you know the consumer is located in, and uh, we seek you know a broad variety of remedies. But one of those um, is called injunctive relief, and that's basically a court order for the company to stop falsely representing its products. And so that's sort of the beginning of the lawsuit, and then how the lawsuits sort of turn out, or what happens, you know, can vary based on whether court ordered judgment or whether the case resolves through a settlement, really the, the outcome is uncertain, but we're always, you know, using these lawsuits and representing consumers in these ways to try to stop uh, these companies from lying about their products and to try to help animals by decreasing consumer demand for animal products that are represented in, in false ways. So why do you think lawsuits are a good approach for combating the problem of humane washing? There are many reasons to, to, to bring a lawsuit and many things that a lawsuit does beyond just, you know, representing the plaintiff in, in the civil action against the defendant. Lawsuits, of course, we're trying to, to win and to get victory through the court, whether through a judgment or a settlement. But the lawsuit is also, you know, a focal point, a jumping off point for a conversation. We publicize our lawsuits and in that publicity, we try to gain you know, more attention for the problem, the problem of humane washing. 
And so these lawsuits are very much a vehicle by which we want to tell people not to trust the labeling and, and marketing that they're seeing from these companies um, and to really open people's eyes about what is happening to farmed animals on these farms. And so lawsuits are a way of, of getting attention, a way of holding the seller accountable, um, and a way of starting a public conversation about this important issue. So I want to ask you, Kelsey, about the Hormel case. I know that there were numerous different species of animals involved, uh, turkeys and pigs. Uh, tell us about the Hormel lawsuit. Sure. So um, in 2016, we brought a lawsuit against Hormel over their natural choice uh, advertisements. So these were a series of advertisements for their natural choice brand of deli meat and bacon that ran under the headline, Make the Natural Choice. And so the, the advertisements were all about, you know, convincing people that these products were natural and um, sort of all of that, that term connotes. Uh, so naturally raised and treated humanely and that the products themselves didn't have, um, you know, preservatives and, and such. And we knew that, you know, the pigs and turkeys, to, to give two examples, the lives that they lead on Hormel's factory farms are so far from being natural, so far from being humane, that we had to, you know, step in and do something. And one way we knew that was from an undercover investigation that we conducted earlier that year of a Hormel pig breeding supplier called the Mash Offs. And in this investigation, we found pigs, you know, trapped in body gripping crates denied food, denied veterinary care with large open wounds, bloody cysts. It was just the most revolting video you can imagine. The pigs were just suffering horribly. And then of course, you know, with the baby piglets taken away from their mothers, their tails cut off, their testicles ripped out. Piglets who weren't able to thrive were bashed on the floor to try to kill them through, you know, thumping. You know, so really the most egregious, you know, conditions you can imagine. Yeah, and thumping that just so people know that is an industry term for killing the the runt piglets, the smallest piglets that they don't think will get up to market weight and thumping is where they just will just throw them on against the concrete floor to kill them or against the wall uh, to try to kill them. That's uh, it's industry standard. Exactly, yeah, manual uh, blunt force trauma, basically holding their legs and slamming their heads against the concrete. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, the investigation documented these piglets, you know, convulsing and, and still alive minutes after that, after being thumped. Mm. Um, and so, you know, this, this was the reality for, for pigs raised for Hormel's products. And similarly with turkeys, you know, turkeys packed into these windowless sheds, you know, breathing ammonia from all the waste that they had to walk on, you know, their, their sensitive beaks cut off, and then sent to slaughter at a very young age. So, you know, the conditions just couldn't have been further from the reality that Hormel was trying to paint with its, you know, uh, advertisements talking about all natural and 100% natural and make the natural choice. Yeah, and, and turkeys also, people don't realize that the slaughter for turkeys can be so horrendous because their bodies are so, so over bloated and overweight uh, from genetic engineering and breeding uh, that when they, they hang the turkeys upside down from their legs in shackles and their body is so heavy, it dislocates like all the joints in their ankles, legs, all the way down their legs, holding that, that weight and can be incredibly, incredibly painful to be slaughtered, to go to slaughter that way. And then of course it's throat slitting uh, and bleeding out, which can take agonizing minutes. The slaughter of turkeys is, is just brutal. Mm -hmm. And of course, turkeys aren't protected by, you know, it, it, at least pigs have some minimal protection from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, although that is, you know, not very well enforced. But turkeys have no protection whatsoever at slaughter, and so they can be slaughtered, you know, in any manner. That's right. And, turkeys, and turkeys and no... chickens, all, all birds are exempt from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So how does your legal work fit into the broader fight for transparency in animal farming? Yeah, I mean, 
as I mentioned, you know, we view these lawsuits, obviously we're trying to win, we're trying to represent our client and get victory for them, but we also view them as a communications tool, as a campaign tool, as a way of, you know, shedding light onto the travesty that is, you know, industrial farming. And so these lawsuits and um, our work against humane washing is just one part of a broader fight for more transparency into what is happening to animals on farms. Other examples might include, you know, our, our lawsuits against uh, ag gag laws, for example, that criminalize whistleblowing and undercover investigations inside farms and slaughterhouses, you know, because we need, again, we need the investigations to tell us what is happening inside farms to demonstrate the falsity of the representation. So um, yeah, I actually wanted to ask about ag gag laws. I'm glad you brought them up. And I know that one just passed in Canada, but I think one was overturned in North Carolina. First of all, what are they? Maybe explain exactly what they are and what's going on with them and why they're problematic for animals. Sure. So ag gag laws in general are laws that criminalize or create civil causes of action for private parties to sue investigators and whistleblowers who go undercover inside farms and slaughterhouses and document the reality of what animals are suffering. And so these laws, you know, work in a variety of ways. Many of them criminalize deception or um, gaining access by false pretenses because, you know, one of the sort of necessities of of an undercover investigation is someone saying that they're not affiliated with an animal rights organization or to get a job at a facility and thereby document the conditions inside. So, you know, these laws were passed in, in many states and we've been attacking them um, in state after state after state. We are currently litigating in Arkansas and Iowa and defending a win in Kansas and basically, you know, going where the fight takes us. And so, yes, we just got a victory in North Carolina, but then that was passed, you know, that, that was uh, followed. I don't know if the, the Ontario law preceded it or, or was immediately followed by it, but for every victory, we have to ensure that states are not passing new laws and, you know, trying to find creative ways to criminalize this incredibly important tool that animal advocates have for showing the reality of, of what's happening inside farms and slaughterhouses. Yeah, it's uh it's it's really a scary prospect because the undercover investigating it's it's so important it's really, you know, the only way that we can see what's really happening to these animals. Uh, they will not let anyone in, not not journalists, not anyone. So, it's really the only way that we're able to get the truth out and I hope very much that these ag gag laws can get shot down. Thank you for working on that. Yeah, it's um it's an incredibly important fight and one that I'm proud to be to be part of. So yeah, yeah. it will go on. Good. So uh, is there any connection between these legal efforts to combat humane washing that that you're part of and the rise of plant-based meat that we're seeing, all these animal-free meats that mimic meat. There's such an incredible rise and surge in this plant-based meats. Is there a connection? Yeah, I mean, definitely. We have seen as companies try to describe their products in, in ways that are false and misleading, now companies who, who are making these products can actually describe their products as humane or more sustainable um, or cruelty-free. And that has prompted a, you know, a pretty massive backlash against these innovative new companies. And that's come in the form of you know, efforts to restrict those companies from using the terms that consumers recognize. So using terms like meat or burger or sausage to describe these products and laws banning or restricting the plant-based companies from using those terms have been passed in a slew of states. And we're now fighting, uh, you know, filing constitutional challenges against some of those laws. And at the same time, plant-based meat, you know, companies have tried to lobby the federal government to restrict these kind of terms in labeling and in general just to attack the competition rather than compete you know on a on a fair playing ground and so we're very disturbed by that but we know it's because you know the these companies see plant-based meat as 
um, a real threat. And knowing that they can never be humane, they have to, you know, try to hamstring them. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, like you said, knowing that they can never be truthful, they can never be humane, they can never be cruelty free. It's inherent in the animal agriculture industry. And that's what I found through writing my book, The Ultimate Betrayal, and, and, and researching it. Even, even companies that want to be more humane, they just can't because there's inherent cruelties that you have to do to make a profit. Taking the babies away from the moms, separating families in, in, in no matter the animal, and uh, you know body mutilations, all these things that they just wouldn't make a profit if they didn't do these horrible things. Uh, so that's, that's really interesting that you say that, that they know they can never really be humane. They can never really be cruelty-free. So they are trying to stop the plant-based meats from advertising the truth, what they really are, the truly cruelty-free burger. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there was an interesting development in Costa Rica recently. There's a city that uh, gave legal personhood to pollinators like butterflies and bees, as well as uh, some native plants and tree species. And I thought this was really interesting and kind of goes along with work that the, the Non-Human Rights Project, the work they've done trying to move the status of animals from property to personhood and protection. What do you think about that? And, uh, you know, how, how is that movement going? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak about the Costa Rica um, effort. I'm not familiar with that, but we have seen just an amazing explosion of, of developments around the world recognizing animals as not just property, as individuals who deserve rights and protection and recognition under the law. You know, we are pursuing work at a variety of levels and through litigation and policy to really expose that animals are not things. They are not a chair, they're not a car, they're not a piece of personal property. They're individuals, sentient individuals with their own lives, their own feelings, their own uh, senses of being, and that the law should recognize that. And so whether it's you know bringing cases like our case on behalf, behalf of Justice the Horse in Oregon to try to get him you know justice uh, after he was abused, um, or, you know, other efforts to try to recognize animals as individuals in state legislatures. You know, these t can take tell a us, Tell us more about Justice. What was his story? Sure. So Justice was a horse who was egregiously abused by his owner. Um, his owner was charged and found guilty. And Justice went to live uh, at a horse sanctuary. And Justice had chronic, you know, medical conditions. He was in, you know, he was suffering and had and required a lot of care to restore him to health. And so we filed a lawsuit on his behalf, naming him as the plaintiff against his abuser, wow. alleging that she had engaged in negligence and, you know, not given justice the care that he deserved and that as a result, he, you know, should be compensated for the harm that, that, that he suffered. And, you know, the case is really simple. His, his abuser uh, violated the animal cruelty law, and her violation of the animal cruelty law resulted in da damages to justice, and so we're trying to get those damages. And so the case is now up in appeal. We, um, it was dismissed in the trial court, and we're bringing the case up on appeal now. And so we're hopeful that Oregon court will recognize that justice is not, you know, some piece of personal property, but as an individual who should have the wrongs done to him redressed by the court. So Justice has a very ironic name. <laughs> I, I love <laughs> that his name is Justice. Uh, but I'm curious, so so he, you were able to get justice for justice <laughs> because of anti-cruelty laws. But what about the animals in animal industry, in farming and animal farming, why is it that you can't, you know, have cases with animal cruelty for farmed animals? I believe that there is, there's exemptions, right? That farmed animals aren't covered under the basic 
animal cruelty laws that we know for dogs and cats and, and horses. Is, is that right? That's mostly right. I mean, it's true that a number of states do have exemptions for farmed animals. They either exempt farmed animals entirely or they declare that, you know, the cruelty that is done to farmed animals does not, you know, is not covered by the animal cruelty law, the the state's animal cruelty law. So it is true that a number of states do, you know, leave farmed animals entirely unprotected. But many states don't. Many, many states cover farmed animals. And so it's a matter of ensuring that those laws that this, in the states where farmed animals are included in the law and that animal farming is not exempt, that those laws be fully enforced to protect farmed animals. So California is a great example. California does not have an exemption for farmed animals. And so the cruelty that's happening on farms is illegal and should be, you know, should be stopped. And, you know, that's why we uh, try to use a variety of legal tools to, you know, advocate for prosecution, um, to try to support prosecutors when faced with cases of farmed animal cruelty, um, but also to use civil means to, you know, to use civil lawsuits to try to ensure that these laws are, are fully enforced. Yeah. And also another reason why the ag-gag laws <clears throat> are so dangerous because if you can't see the cruelty, if you can't prove the cruelty on video, then those anti-cruelty laws, you know, are useless. Yeah. I mean, you know, the the video, video really doesn't lie. It's hard to defend, even if it's a common industry practice, you know, it's hard for these industries to defend piglets who is having his tail cut off and his testicles ripped out. You know, it's hard to defend that. And so, Mm -hmm. Again, these these ag gag laws, you know, that's why we're so intent on defeating them because these investigations are so important for telling the truth and getting, you know, the changes in policy and law that we that are so desperately needed for animals. So Kelsey, what gives you hope for the future? Yeah, I mean a lot. People are starting to wake up. You know, people are seeing what really can't be denied. So many undercover investigations, so much imagery and videos that really shows the reality. And people don't want any part of that. And so I am definitely given hope by the number of people who are rejecting animal products and going vegan. I'm also hopeful about, you know, animals evolving place in the legal system. I think, you know, we've seen some amazing changes in how animals are viewed in society and and under the law that, you know, really gives me hope for my own work through the legal system to protect animals. And then, the rise of, of products that can take the place in people's diets of these cruel animal products, you know, that's another thing that gives me tremendous hope and makes, you know, a vegan world seem a little bit less, <laughs> a little bit less far off, a little bit less crazy. Um, so I have a lot of sources of hope, um, as I think, you know, we really have to, to continue to confront animal suffering of this magnitude, you know, day after day. We do need to wrap up now, but I wanted to ask if you would like to, you know, say any last words, any final thoughts, and how can people get in touch with you if they have questions or would like to talk to you about the work you do? Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a really illuminating discussion. You can reach me at uh, K Aberly, E-B-E-R-L-Y, at ALDF.org. It's funny, the question I often get asked, which I knew you wouldn't ask, but the question I often get asked and when I'm talking about this work is, well, sort of how can I find, you know, how can I find the truly humane products? Can, how, how can I know what labels to trust? And it's such a difficult question for me to a- answer because I don't want to say you can't, although sometimes that's the truth. I mean, I sort of can tell people what labels are more likely to be false than others. But really, as you were saying, you know, you, you can't trust what these companies are saying and and so if I sort of have one overarching thought, it's, you know, don't, don't trust what you're listening to, what you're seeing, what you're reading, and when it's coming from the, the companies that are trying to sell you animal products. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey. It's been great. And thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast. You can support this podcast and help us out by leaving a rating or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please do your part to help make the world a better place for animals and live vegan. 